Howdy, folks. Time is precious and oh so fleeting. Yet we have so many interesting people to meet and remarkable things to see. Join me, won't you? It's the Ultimate Cleveland Show. It starts now. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Ultimate Cleveland Show. I'm Mike Polk, Jr., and we are dedicating this episode to celebrating a major milestone, that, of course, being... We're almost two-thirds of the way through the Cleveland Browns regular season schedule! Oh, man. It still seems too crazy to be true. It's hard to believe that this Brown season, which seems like it just started last week, is now nearly but not quite two-thirds over, and that we only have just slightly more than one-third of a season remaining. But you can't argue with the math, and the graphic is right here. So, everything checks out. And of course, you might be wondering, but Mike, why are you doing this now? Not quite, but almost two-thirds of the way through the season. Seems kind of arbitrary. Why not do this halfway through the season? Or maybe at the end? Wouldn't that make more sense? To which I would reply, you know what? I don't care for your tone. It's nasty, and it's condescending. But to answer your question, I'm not doing it at the end of the season because we're not there yet, so I couldn't, even if I wanted to. Genius. And I didn't do it in the middle of the season because ever since the NFL added a game to the schedule, there no longer is a discernible midpoint to the season where we can do that. I mean, seriously, what is the proper time to do a mid-season evaluation these days? Eight games seems premature. Nine games seems negligent. Based on the new 17-game schedule, the only true accurate time to have done it would have been during halftime of Game 8 at home against the Cincinnati Bengals. That was the midpoint of the season. But as I recall, we tailgated that Halloween game pretty hard, and I'm not sure I could have done a proper mid-season evaluation during that 12-minute window, even if I had wanted to, and if I hadn't have been wearing a Jack Sparrow costume, which I was. But of course, as we all know, the Browns are entering the second phase of their season, in a sense, this week, as we prepare for the orchestrated transition from one quarterback to another. Many Browns fans are excited about that, and more than a few are not feeling great about it at all, for very legitimate reasons that we're all very aware of by now. But it's certainly not just those two groups. I believe that the vast majority of Browns fans populate a more nuanced middle ground, I know that's where I'm at. I wish that being a fan of my childhood football team were not so profoundly challenging and morally complicated. That'd be great, but here we are, and here we go. So that's why this week feels like the second act of a two-act play, even though the performance is technically almost but not quite two-thirds over. Some people ask me how I can possibly manage to continue being a fan of this team that has done so little to earn my support over the years, and believe me, that is a totally fair question. I suppose my best guess is that I was indoctrinated at a very early age by my elders, before I was capable of making my own decisions. And that indoctrination was very effective. I'm also old enough that I got to see some really good Browns football as a kid, so I do remember what good football was like. And I have a positive association with that era of players and the history of the team. I also enjoyed the community of Browns fandom, and that sense of community is not dependent upon the outcome of the games or the competence of the franchise as a whole. And finally, I've just always felt that there is a strange sense of honor in remaining loyal to truly lost causes. So there's all that, but mostly it was getting brainwashed as a kid. That's probably the main factor. Of course, we all do have our breaking points. We all have a moment where we can take no more, and we must take action. Even if the action conceived of is not at all well thought out. Personally, I snapped on November 7th, 2011. The Browns had just lost another miserable game to the Houston Texans. There wasn't even anything particularly remarkable about it. It was just the one that, for whatever reason, caused me to drive down to the stadium at night, set up a camera, light myself with my headlights, and get some stuff off my chest. Hey Browns, Mike Polk, season ticket holder. Killer game in Houston today. Well, thank God we built you. What a blessing for the community. You are wasting valuable space on our majestic shoreline, and what do we get out of it from you? 10 miserable games a year, including two preseason games that I have to pay for, and one shitty Kenny Chesney concert. Do you understand that it is actually statistically harder for a team to be this consistently bad than it is for them to occasionally accidentally be good? The probability is staggering. Did you happen to see that Packers Chargers game today? It's like they're playing a different sport than you are. And here's what you have to understand. We don't even expect you to be good. We just want you to be watchable. Do you have any idea how low our expectations are? We don't expect you to win the Super Bowl. We just want you to look better than a Division III high school team. And listen, I know that there are way more important things in life than football, but you are supposed to be our pleasant distraction from those things. But all we do is pay you money to put us in a bad mood every week. You are a factory of sadness! I'll see you Sunday. 
And as we all know, right after that video went viral, the Browns took my message to heart, started doing everything differently, and it's been a great organization ever since. I jest, it's remained quite bad. And this QB carousel of ours, are you kidding me? Do you have any idea how long Browns fans have been waiting for the right quarterback? Of course you have, you're watching this. Sorry, forgot who I was talking to. Well, a while back, in order to illustrate just how long this QB search has been going on, I went to training camp to test Browns fans' knowledge. Do you know this man? He is one of 29 Browns starting quarterbacks since 1999. We have a lot of long suffering Browns fans here at training camp. I'm gonna see just how many of these quarterbacks who started for their team, they can actually recognize. Name that Browns quarterback! <laughs> who is this former starting Browns quarterback? Oh geez, I don't even know. Handsome devil, isn't he? Jeff Garcia. And, yeah, that is Jeff Garcia. I thought I was excited when we got him. Oh. And then he threw that 99 yard touchdown. Yep, never get excited. Never get excited. How about this, this big hunk of man? Uh, who is that? Um, That's Trent Dilfer. Okay, Dilfer. It's okay. okay. Who is this former Cleveland Browns starting quarterback? I don't know. For a seven up right now. A seven up in exchange for who this quarterback is. Um. That is Derek Anderson. That's a man wins a seven up. Congratulations. Oh, I will accept Dilfer for Anderson if someone says it, and I'll accept Anderson for Dilfer. Who's this guy? Looks like Whedon. Yeah, he does kind of, a lot of them kind of look like Whedon, but aren't. Uh, I don't know. That's a McCown. We had two McCown starters. That is Luke. That is Luke McCown. Very good. How about, remember this guy? Oh, I was excited when they drafted that. Oh yeah, Johnny Manziel, unfortunately. Yeah, you kind of stared off into the distance when you said it. You're like, yeah. yeah. I Whenever I showed it to somebody, it's like somebody had to come and identify their kid at the morgue. They're like, that's my son. <laughs> Remember this guy? That's Seneca Wallace. Seneca Wallace, you are running the gamut on this, just so you know. How about, this one's really tricky. You're like a savant if you get this dude. He was one of those like brief ones from like the late 2000, like Hogan? recent. That is Hogan. Oh my gosh! Goodness. This is the first guy to get Kevin Hogan. Dude. This is what you've been training for your whole life and you weren't yeah. even aware of it. Give this man a round of applause. Yeah. Well, the good news, folks, is pretty soon, none of us will have to remember who any of the McCown brothers are because it does look like we might finally have our quarterback. This is Mike Polk at Training Camp, Channel 3 News. Oh, Spurgeon win! Why weren't you the promised one we thought you were? <laughs> as I said earlier, we're about to make yet another QB transition this week, as we bid farewell to a beloved character who played a major role in the first act of our production, but who is not scheduled to appear in any remaining scenes. And it just so happens that I have some thoughts on that. This is admittedly strange for us. See, traditionally, when a Browns QB relinquishes his starting job, it's between seasons, or it's during the season because they were too bad to wait for the end of the season and we just needed it to stop. What's so unique about this particular changing of the guard is that for once we have a starting Browns QB stepping down amicably, as planned, with no hard feelings between the player and the fans. It's a new situation for us and it's pretty clear we're having a hard time processing it. See, normally when our QB loses his starting job, we fans are ripping on him for coming up short and letting us down. But this time our reaction is quite different. There is a lot of Jacoby Brissett love out there right now. The outpouring of affection online is everywhere, and I get it. The guy came into a difficult situation and showed leadership, poise, and maturity. That being said, I do feel like some people might be going a little overboard. After all, we're not watching Cal Ripken retire here. We're watching a likable journeyman quarterback hand over the reins of a mediocre team after going four and seven through a relatively soft schedule. Now here's you. But Mike, it wasn't Jacoby's fault. The defense stinks. Largely true but the defense didn't prevent Jacoby from making big plays in big moments. The defense didn't cause him to throw just 12 touchdowns in 11 games. Well, Mike, that's not fair. I saw a stat that said Brissett had the sixth highest QBR ranking in the league. To which I say, that's great. How many points does my team get for that? None? No. Oh. To be clear, I'm not ragging on what Brissett did this season. He's been exactly what the locker room needed. Historically speaking, prior to this season, Brissett had a lifetime starting record of 14 and 23 for a 37% win rate. This season, he won 36% of his games, proving he's nothing if not consistent. So why are we Browns fans, who are notoriously not the most charitable when it comes to critiquing our outgoing quarterbacks, treating Brissett with such reverence on his way out the door, with many people going so far as to suggest that he should maintain the starting job despite Watson's return? 
A little history. In 2005, the Browns' starting quarterback was eventual Super Bowl champion Trent Dilfer. It didn't happen when he was with us. So what happened to him? After he also started that season by going 4-7, and seven, did we praise Dilfer for his grit? No. We tore him apart and replaced him with Charlie Fry. To the best of my knowledge, there was no outpouring of affection for Trent Dilfer's effort, and no one was thanking him with overt displays of appreciation on MySpace and Friendster. 2005. As sports fans, we have a tendency to react emotionally rather than logically. Everything is situational, and Jacoby Brissett benefited from two very key factors. One, low expectations based on his past body of work. And two, not being Deshaun Watson. And I do think that second factor is quite important. The reason we're lionizing a quarterback who just went four and seven is because much of the fan base is still understandably conflicted or downright depressed about the person who is about to replace him. Because try as we might, as humans, it's impossible to separate our emotions from our analytics. All that said, I'd still like to add my voice to the choir in saying sincere thanks to you, JB. You did what we asked of you, and you did it with class. Your reward, in addition to the $5 million the Browns paid you this year, is the contract you'll get next year to start for some other team that is in complete crisis mode and requires a steady presence and competent game management while they try to get their act together. Thank you for your service, young man. And go Browns. At this point, I do feel like it's important to point out that I am not just a miserable, pessimistic Browns fan by any means. Despite everything this team has done to me, I actually remain quite hopeful, ready, and willing for them to become consistently good and competent anytime they're ready to do it. If I ever do come off as a bit cynical, it's merely the rational response to observable history and past experience, not unwarranted negativity simply for the sake of it. Just give me a reason to celebrate you and I will. If you need further proof of that, you need look no further than this segment I did less than two years ago, in which I closed the factory of sadness. Just a warning, this one's a pretty tough watch now, guys. You are a factory of sadness! Welcome, everyone, to the end of an era. I speak, of course, of the long-awaited closing of the Factory of Sadness. She opened way back in 99, when Livin' La Vida Loca topped the charts, and it has been cranking out nothing but the purest, uncut, grade-A misery for over 20 years until now. As the old saying goes, all good things must come to an end. So do the bad things, it turns out, because here we are, the curse now broken by this year's legitimately good, playoff-bound Cleveland Browns! And it is because of that very success that this factory must now close. Like most commodities, sadness is a supply and demand business. And due to the changing market trends of the Browns now being good and fun to watch, we are simply no longer producing enough sadness to justify keeping these lights on. I expect no one to weep at the long-awaited shuddering of this scene of so much of our civic torment. I know that it has produced a lot of heartache, ruined many weekends, and more than a few marriages. It is the scene of the crime to countless historic travesties, such as Bottlegate, the Helmet Toss Game, and Brandon Whedon, just to name a few. But the point is, those days are now officially over! Not because of fate, not because of luck, but because this team earned it. They earned this closing. They overcame great obstacles in a super gross year with a brand new coach who knows what he's doing for once and who all of our ants have kind of a thing for. And oh, did I mention that we're going to the playoffs for the first time since the year Men in Black 2 came out in theaters? They have earned this. So, Godspeed and best of luck to you this weekend, young gladiators. And thank you for what has already been a remarkable season in a year when we were beyond grateful for the pleasant distraction of your spirit and your success. And with that, the moment is now upon us. I'll see you Sunday.
So that did not work out long term. People have asked me what the current status of the factory is and I honestly don't even know what to tell them. Sometimes it sure seems like they might have fired up those furnaces again and started cranking out some product, but regardless, their brand is still very strong. Hey, remember in the beginning of this season when we had spent all summer agonizing over a legitimate Browns controversy? And then, thankfully, like a blessing from on high, someone decided to paint a mythical creature at midfield of Brown Stadium, and we all got to talk about that for a second instead? Whew. Talk about a great distraction at the right time. Hey folks, throughout this entire week, fully grown adults, many of whom I would assume have careers and children, have been arguing online about Brownie the Elf's midfield debut. Some are condemning it, some are defending it. Some seem to be stuck in the weeds arguing about what particular genus of mythical species Brownie actually is. Regardless, thanks to the voting Browns public, Brownie the Elf is now adorning our midfield. Some people genuinely love the elf and the history behind it. Some people are like me and they could not possibly care less what logo is at midfield as long as Miles Garrett manages to throw Joe Flacco down on top of it repeatedly. And then of course, you have the reliable contingent of people who are somehow genuinely upset by this development, primarily because they consider the elf mascot to be quite lame and incapable of intimidating our rivals. Which seems a bit silly. Do you really think that Aaron Donald has ever been reluctant to come out of the locker room when they're playing Seattle because he's too scared of the big cartoon Seahawk on the field? Of course not. These are monstrous NFL players. They don't care about our logos. But more directly, even if we don't have the scariest mascot in the NFL, we're also not the least intimidating. In fact, I've determined that there are five teams that have far less terrifying mascots than we do. Maybe this will make you feel better. Number one, the Steelers. Look, I don't like the Steelers, but you can't act like they haven't been a scary team for us in recent history. And that's despite the fact that their logo is a mill worker. I mean, that's a tough job, but I'm not scared of a mill worker. And it's a similar deal in Green Bay. They're literally named after meat packers. Again, a noble profession to be sure, but I can't be afraid of a guy who shaves my turkey cold cuts at Giant Eagle. I'm sorry. Or how about them Texans? This is a team literally named after the people who live in the state where the team plays. And I'm not saying there are no intimidating people from Texas. That's obviously not true. I'm just saying that I'm not scared of all Texans. The Jonas Brothers, for example, are from Texas. I'm not scared of the Jonas Brothers. I'm also not scared of the San Francisco 49ers because I refuse to be afraid of an old-timey gold prospector. And finally, the Browns will never ever have the lamest mascot because we still have the Dolphins. And to be clear, I love Dolphins. They're adorable. They're intelligent, they squeak. They even had their own TV show. They call him Flipper, Flipper, faster than lightning. All great stuff, not remotely intimidating. So there you have it, folks. Sure, we might not have the most intimidating mascot in the league, but things could always be worse. Under the sea. Oh, man. Poignant and colorful as always, Mike. Well, as we approach the end of this almost two-thirds of the way through the Brown season special, I do want to remind you all that whether you support this team or you don't, you have every right to yell at them. Your tax dollars pay for their stadium and its upkeep, and that gives you the right to complain as much and as loud as you want, and I will always support you in that. And that's coming from someone who woke up early a few years back to march in the Browns' perfect season parade after the team went 0-16. What do we want? And that remains all that I want. Watchable football. And for the most part, Jacoby Brissett provided that. And when you've seen as much terrible quarterback play as I have over the years, Deshaun Kaiser, then you can really appreciate that level of basic competence. So thanks, Jacoby. And thanks for watching, everyone. Stay Cleveland strong. Let's roll some of Jacoby's, Jacoby's highlights. <laughs>